merchandising is more of a numerical control of the stock that you are bringing into the business and you want to move around your business. Um, visual merchandising deals with the treatment of your store in store experience and online store experience. So basically, uh, organizing the merchandise and the aesthetics of the store to suit the brand, reflect the brand, and entice the consumer to walk in. So you're not just going in the store, being overwhelmed and doing what I call the 360 walkout. So you just kind of walk halfway in, there's just too much going on, you kind of do it at this, and then you walk right back out. And you don't want that happening in your store. Once you notice that happening, it means your VM is very off. This is about basically understanding what we should order, how much quantities, how much of a certain color, etc., we need to include in our range and in terms of range planning. So the thing about fashion merchandising that's uh, kind of problematic or what makes it complex is that fashion is changing a lot quicker than it used to. So we need to have more styles more frequently in store. The other thing is we have way more user occasions than we did before. So now I need an outfit for the gym to sleep, to go to work, to go to school, um, to go and party, maybe to go to my friend's wedding, to go to church. So base, uh, to go on your boat cruise, which is like a big thing now. See swimwear is kind of infiltrating a lot of mainstream products, but that is what a user occasion essentially is. Uh, type of event that requires you to dress in a certain manner. Um, so that's adding a lot of complexity. <clears throat> Not only that, in order to stay relevant and competitive, retailers and designers are expanding their product ranges. So <clears throat> people that probably typically only dealt in garments are now expanding to include accessories or shoes, et cetera, and other lifestyle products to get increased cash flow. So women's and children's fashion still are more prone to change. They have a, a faster rate of change than men's, men's wear. So, you know, if you're dealing in a woman's market, congratulations, you're dealing with the most complicated segment. And they will require a lot more variety than the men. So the aim of merchandising, why do we need to do it? It's to de-risk your merchandise as much as possible. Now the thing with designers are, a lot of times you all are working on instinct. So you really don't have a good idea of what is going to be the demand for your products. You make it, you have your show, but you don't know if you're gonna sell 10 of these pants, five of them, and this is where merchandising comes in, especially for the mass market retailers. We essentially do not want to make product that there's no demand for which can often stifle your creativity and lead to bland designs, but for the most part, you're going to have items that will sell. So de-risking is the business is um, essentially trying to reduce bad selling merchandise and carry as much uh, merchandise that's in demand as possible. So achieving a balance between producing highly risky range against one that's classic depends on the market being targeted. So like I said, all this is saying is that you should never only have fashionable items in your store, high fashion items. You also need to have the classics and the basics. And same thing with, uh, like I said, Louis Vuitton. They have a ton of mass marketed products. I may not be able to buy a $15,000 bag, but I can definitely spend $200 buying a belt and rocking that logo in my trouser loops um, and kind of transferring that brand identity. So we want to mix classics with fashion. And even a store like Zara, which is very, very fashion forward, they do 60% classics, 40%. Um, fashionable or what we call high-risk items. The traditional target, someone like H&M, they do 80% basics, classics, and only 20% fashionable items. So again, it's not only about having really, really fashionable stuff, also having leggings, the wife beaters, etc. So in terms of the importance of pl um, planning, Basically, that's what we're gonna look at right now and um, ensure that we have a proper mix of garments and just some little tools we could use to ensure that we have a nice balanced range. The other thing about classics are um, we always can update it, which is another thing, and a lot of retailers do that. So um, 
even like Levi, for example, jeans, which is a classic item that's all they sell, but every season, whatever's uh, in style in terms of color, that will change. So for a while we saw a lot of pastel jeans, then it was all about ripped jeans and acid wash jeans, etc. So it's the same product, but it's been modified to suit every season. When chiffon tops came out, chiffon shirts came out as well. We saw that move from color to nautical stripes to animal prints, um, back to stripes, etc. But it was the same chiffon shirt. We just changed the colorways and the material. So we always want to update basics. Um, and this essentially is the seasons that we're catering for that we spoke about. We know that uh, season, you will have to define how many seasons you want to cater for in a year, and that goes for retailers and designers. You um, essentially, what we have now in terms of the big seasons, where we could draw a lot of the forecast now, there's the spring, summer, autumn, winter season. And then two big players that have really come into the game have been the pre collection or the cruise or resort collection. And this is something that was made or started by the luxury designers that essentially were catering for the wealthier tourists that would be traveling and they needed a vacation wardrobe, a resort wardrobe. Right? And then the high summer collection was also created. And um, even though it's called high summer, it's more pre-winter. Essentially, uh, weather patterns abroad have become a little erratic. So they need a transitional line that took them from summer into winter without going for those uh, very heavy garments right away. So they are more transitional line of clothing. So the number of um, products that you make that will be attached to your uh, budget and also make sure that more allocated to your core colors like white in a summer collection than a fashion color. Down to the end of the year too, you tend to find more saturated core colors. Summer, you'll find more light, breezy, um, cool core colors. So the buy-in profit essentially is the difference between the cost price, what it costs for you to make it, and for retailers it's a lot easier because they buy a lot of their clothes from manufacturers. So we know we just pay them one flat cost and then we will add our shipping expenses or rentals and that kind of stuff. But for the designers it's a lot different because how much electricity did I use to make this item? How much time did I spend? So you really need to track. People like, ah, oh, tread is tread. I'm really going to count that in it. But every, everything counts. And you need to pay yourself as well. A lot of times, people aren't paying themselves. So if it took you four hours to do something, you should have a per hour fee as well. Um, the other thing is, um, you're not going to charge more for a large than a small, even though a large is using more materials. So you also need to subsidize and break that down over the course of the entire item and understand that, okay, well, I'm not just gonna go with the small price. So you need to check the cost at the biggest item that you're using, the most materials, standardize that across all of your sizes.